people and we had a team working on projects. I really enjoyed those sorts of things. Also being creative uh, with the marketing classes. Um, those were my favorite um, types of courses. And again, it's, it, it, and thinking back, it has really translated into um, you know, where I am today. Right. And we did get one question uh, written in ahead of time about what role did your involvement in Greek life have in your individual development? So interesting. Uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> I had a lot of fun. Uh -huh. uh, but I also, you know, I, I think back about that. I met the best friends that I have uh, from new age uh, at my story, which is all the time. So, um, you know, being from Manchester, New Hampshire, and going to UNH, um, at the time, it was sort of like, oh, I'm going to UNH, like everyone else is going to UNH. Um, but once you're there and you realize the number of students that are there from outside of New Hampshire and Manchester, um, it again, it was an amazing experience and I can't imagine going anywhere, anywhere else. Uh, but I met a group of women who were from all over the country and they're my best friends today from college. So um, that's, that's really, you know, when I think back about my experiences there, that's I'm sure one of them sent me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell us about a time when advancing your career or starting to take on a challenge that was way outside of your comfort zone or about your expectations? Just something that was really hard. And how did you manage your discomfort or what happened? I mean, you know, there are a number of things that come to mind, but even just making the decision to run for mayor um, was one of those decisions where. Um, it was outside of my comfort zone because again, this is nothing that I had my sights on. Um, the offices that I held prior to were a specific ward, so uh, my neighborhood, if you will, and running for mayor is city by uh, over 110,000 people. And, um, and so that was something that uh, really I had to think seriously about. And thankfully, uh, I had the support of my husband uh, and my children and other community members um, who really encouraged me to do that and um, and so that's that's really you know one of the most major things in terms of the, the most significant decision that I had to make and I'm tremendously grateful that I made it and tremendously grateful to be serving uh, again a community that I was born and raised in that my husband was as well my dad my grandmother and uh, we've been really able to uh, make some significant enhancements and changes in the city to make it better and stronger. Great. Uh, were there any obstacles that you had to overcome in, in doing, making those decisions? How did you overcome? Sure. Well, I mean, as you mentioned, I am the first female mayor of the city of Manchester. So um, that in and of itself uh, was an obstacle. Yeah. And, um, you know, when, when you're knocking doors and talking to people, uh, that's not uh, a woman running for mayor. Um, is not the visual that they have or the thought that they have. And so I had to prove myself, um, both from a capability perspective, but also with uh, an individual, and that I am prepared and ready and capable of leading you know, this city. That is actually a great segue to the next question. And I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about Manchester and New Hampshire. Um, and so from my perspective, Manchester has changed so much in the last 20 years, and probably more, more than that. Um, with so many worthy and critically important priorities, how do you determine where to make the most difference? And then what do you feel are the top challenges or obstacles or issues and going to be in trouble with anybody? So just what are, I'm sure they're next, but what, what are the most important things that you're focused on if you had to pick today? Sure. I guess there are three three main things that I think about consistently and education from the get-go has been critical to me. So ensure that every student in Manchester, every student in Manchester has the opportunity to leave to see quality of education is fundamental, right? I mean, we need to make sure that our kids are reading at grade level, um, have the opportunity uh, to experience things that will help them become successful contributing citizens once they graduate. Um, so that's something that I've been consistently focused on and, and uh, do every day. Um, and then in terms of economic development. So um, when you talk about things changing in Manchester, when I think back 20 or so years ago, the building that we're in today had trees growing out of the roof, right? But now we're in this amazing mill yard that is at 98% capacity with colleges and universities and um, international companies and the tech hub and growing biotech um, industry. 
um, in the world. I mean, we are literally creating a new biotech industry, you know, right here, and UNH is participating in that. So um, we are constantly looking at ways to attract and build uh, upon that reputation that we um, we have right now. So encouraging new businesses to come to Manchester. We uh, recently uh, received word that BAE is coming to Manchester uh, over by the airport, and they're bringing 800 new high-paying jobs. And there are many other companies that are looking to the city to to come to. So that's a great thing. Um, when I think about our challenges, um, it's a crisis, which has been um, you know it's a national issue. Uh, we focus on that since day one. Uh, we're fortunate in Manchester that. We have a program called Safe Station, where every single one of our fire stations is open 24 hours a day, obviously. So if anyone is suffering from an addiction issue, they can walk into one of our fire stations and we have a path to get them into treatment. Uh, we, uh, at the time that I became mayor, that process, the back end process was falling apart. So um, I again brought uh, everyone to the table and we really looked at what was working and what wasn't and built a better process. So now instead of taking two to three weeks to get into treatment, it's taking two to three days. And we've been able to, you know, see some significant success in that for the first time ever, we have had a 19% decrease in overdoses in the city and a 22% decrease in overdose deaths. We've never seen a decrease before. So, you know, we know that what we're doing is working. It's certainly not enough. We have to keep our you know, foot on the pedal and continue to, to focus on that issue and do everything we can to help people um, suffering from that. And then also, you know, as part of that is um, the mental health crisis and homelessness. So consistently making sure that we are doing everything we can um, to help individuals that are suffering. And so uh, working closely with Maureen Borgard, who is also a UNH graduate um, at Families in Transition and New Horizons at the shelter. Um, you know, one of the things that we found out recently was that the shelter wasn't open during the day. And so the city utilized uh, federal funds to open them up and to provide services so anyone who is suffering from homelessness and also has a crisis um, can't get the help that they need during the day. So again, working in partnership with nonprofits in the city and doing what we can to help individuals is something that we do every minute of the day. That's great. Do you have, those are, those are three very distinct priorities. Do you have um, ideas or thoughts on how UNH, the university system, can be a partner in working on some of those issues or all of those issues? Sure. I mean, the University of New has been a great partner in many of those issues, and we're really grateful to have you and the presence that we have here in Manchester, uh, certainly from an educational perspective. Um, I benefited from having UNH Manchester um, in the city and that. You know, I took a course before I went to UNH, and then I was able to take summer courses uh, when I was at UNH uh, just to get ahead. Um, and I know for a fact that students are doing that today. Um, my son did it, you know, so um, so that's a great thing. But also your participation in helping with kids um, in, at the high school uh, level and um, your participation um, in helping within our schools is great. Um, you know, keeping, making sure that uh, we have young in our community is paramount to us, and so we love that you're expanding opportunities um, and having students live on campus or even downtown. And from a city perspective, we want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to keep them in the city and make sure that we have the jobs in the city and building a city that interests them so that they want to be here and want to stay here. And then again, your participation with um, the Army project um, is, is great and critical in terms of, again, um, being an attraction for people to want to be here and understand the opportunities that we have in the city. Okay, great. And that's actually a good segue into the, the next question that we often find ourselves looking around and thinking New Hampshire is unquestionably a great place to live. And yet we struggle, and I know there's some members of our recruiting team here today, because more young people leave New Hampshire to go to college than any other state in the country for a variety of reasons. Um, Manchester is, is a great place for people to live. What sort of initiatives do you either do you have in mind or would you like to be able to put, put forward um, to encourage young people to stay in the state, to stay here, live here, settle here? Yeah. I, I mean, I think about my own experiences, and I needed to go somewhere else. I needed to live in Boston for a little bit to realize how great it was here. 
And so I'm not sure that we'll ever be able to like stop that, but we want to make sure that um, people understand that what we have and understand the opportunities that we have and want to come back if they can leave for a little while. But I think about everything that we have in Manchester and um, and talking to you know young adults is really important. But, um, you know, it's it's important for me to get out of the office. Mm -hmm. I've held office hours throughout the city since I've been in office um, to get an understanding of what young people want and need in the community, and they want a vibrant city atmosphere, which I think we're delivering on right now, but can always do better. So it's the bike lanes, it's mm -hmm. the walking trails and um, biking trails. It's the you know when I look at Elm Street, all of the restaurants that we have, and the nightlife is what young people are looking for. Um, we have the Snow Arena, we have um, the Fisher Cats Baseball, and uh, the Palace Theater, and very soon we'll have uh, the Rex Theater, uh, which has been a dilapidated building uh, right in our downtown, uh, completely. But uh, we've got a great public-private partnership right now who is bringing that building back. So I think that I so I started my career actually in a different in a different state in New England. And most of the capacities in the Manchester area were diverse community capacities. Are you hopeful that Manchester will remain a diverse city? And are there ways that, that we as a community and particularly the college can support that? Absolutely. I think it's uh, a great thing that Manchester is so diverse. And I think back to when I grew up. Bring to Manchester, and uh, my kids have been exposed. You know, going to Central, there are over a hundred different languages spoken at that school. Um, I think about my daughter who is a freshman at Central now. But um, over the summer, a few years ago, she was Skyping with one of her uh, friends um, from Hillside at the time, and um, she was in Cairo um, visiting her family. So my daughter was able to sort of see what she was seeing at the time, and 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 that translates to life in our city now and yeah, my goal is to make sure that Manchester is a welcoming place for all, that we encourage um, individuals uh, to pursue opportunities that they may not have had in their home country. So whether it's um, starting a restaurant or a store or an insurance company, but you know our office has been um, a facilitator for that and we will continue to do that. Um, <clears throat> so we have some questions about challenges that women leaders often confront. And you know, you mentioned a little bit that being the first female mayor of Manchester can't be easy, um, I'm sure, in many ways. But um, there was there is a quote from the 2019 McKinsey Union report on the status of women in the workplace, and it says uh, someone someone put it, I would say I've received a fraction of the opportunities I would have as a white man. The ones I did receive, I had to fight really hard for. I've seen many white men groomed for leadership. That didn't happen for me. I had to literally kick the doors open. Well, I know you went door to door. Yeah. Many doors open. <laughs> but um, have you had to kick down other doors along the way? That's an interesting question. Um, I've never really thought about whether I've had to kick any doors down, but I have definitely had to work hard mm -hmm. to get where I am or where I was, you know, in my career prior to where I am today. So, you know, what it's attributed to, I guess it's a tough, I'm not sure if it was, you know, man versus woman, but, um, but yeah, there, there, there are definitely um, obstacles that you have to overcome as a woman, especially in politics. But I do think about New Hampshire and that we are so fortunate, right? From, so from a federal level, uh, we at one time had four women representing New Hampshire. And so it's something that we can aspire to. We see that there's an opportunity there. Uh, but when you look at the local level, and I, I think of the boards in Manchester, 
Um, the school board has a handful of women uh, of the, the, the 14 representatives. Uh, but the board of mayor and aldermen uh, only has two women sitting on, on that board of 14. And again, I'm the first woman mayor. And so, you know, we need to ensure that, uh, or I and others need to ensure that people see a path um, and encourage women um, to, to do that. And sometimes I think part of it is it's difficult, right? You, it's, you've got to have thick skin. Um, you've got to be confident in what you're doing and stand behind what you're doing and, and fight for what you're doing. And and then there's the balance of you know life and work. And and quite honestly, that's a question I get asked a lot. And I don't think that a man would ever be asked, how are you doing all of this? You have three children and doing and being mayor, how are you going to do that? You know, that, that's not something that a man would be asked. Uh, but it's a question that I'm asked often. Um, so, so you know, those are the sorts of differences that I encounter. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because someone specifically did not put that on here because I feel like I should bust that. Yeah. Dave. <laughs> um, so I just had a question. So as far as you mentioned trying to pave a path for future female leaders, and I think when you're young, it's a lot of men see male leaders as role models. And there's fewer examples of that, especially for example, you're the first female mayor. Did you always see yourself as a leader? And how do you think we could cultivate that in our new grads or even younger than that when you're trying to build female leaders for the future? Yeah. Did you always know you were going to be here? Did you feel like a leader? I did not. No. Um, you know, I work more in a group. Um, maybe when I think back, I probably had the qualities, but I, in terms of my self confidence and where I saw myself, no. And it wasn't until, you know, I had a life experience that said, I, I need to do this. I can do this and I need to do this, um, that I did. And I think, you know, that's one of the, the things that it's important to be open and um, to, to what you're going to do and what your potential is. Um, like I said, I never thought that I would be in politics at all. Uh, but it was, you know, sort of my children and my experience and exposure with them that led me to this. Um, and so having an open mind and and being, you know, flexible is really important. So that's actually a great segue into another question that we have is that um, we, here at UNH, we pay a lot of attention to what kids are saying they want to do with their lives. And one of the things, one of the unfortunate trends, because we have a politics Society program or the political science program is that fewer and fewer kids actually say they're interested in going to politics every year. We look back, and so I guess the, the question is, what would you say to those kids? But also, what's fun about what you do, and why would a kid want to, or especially a young woman, why should she want to go into politics? I politics has a bad reputation, <laughs> so I want to take that word out of it, right? But, but think of it as community service. And so if you really want to have an impact on your community, running for local office will allow you to do that. So whether it is on the school board or on a council or running for mayor, I mean, it, it's interesting that we have mayors running for president, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a direct impact on what's going on in your community. And it's really incredible um, what you know we all can do uh, when the board is working together, when a mayor is out in the community and understanding what the needs of that community is and getting people together to accomplish um, important things. So it's it's um, it's it's wanting to help your community, wanting to help people in your community. And if you have that desire, I really think that running for office is a great way to make positive change. We send that out to yeah, our politics <laughs> Um, so do you have specific role models that you've identified uh, throughout your life, or who are your role models? Um, from a family perspective, um, my mom and my grandmother are amazing uh, role models. Uh, you know, my mother uh, was a single mother uh, for most of my life, and uh, she played a tremendous impact in terms of making sure uh, we, you know, I, I didn't come from much, we didn't have very much, but I never knew that and so it was she just did so much to ensure that i 
not we've done everything, you know, and and I look back now and realize she didn't and how hard she worked to ensure that I was comfortable and had no idea. Um, my grandmother, um, same thing, just a strong woman who raised four boys. And so to see that, and, and I'm an only child, so I had a very close relationship with both of them. Um, from a political standpoint, uh, Senator Maggie Hassan has been a tremendous role model for me. Uh, she's a great friend, and um, you know, when I and my husband were considering uh, new running for mayor, uh, you know, she came by our house and sat down on my couch and talked to me about, you know, what I need to think about, but also I'd like to come in and talk to him about, you know, some of the things that she and husband Tom had encountered and things that he should be aware of. So um, she, she was just, she is and was a great um, friend and role model to me. Um, so, it has been said, this is another um, question, I think, from that same survey, that when a man takes a promotion, he then spends 80% of the time doing the job of man, 20% of the time networking, positioning himself for recognition for the next promotion. When a woman takes a promotion, she spends 120% of the time working hard at the job of man. Um, how have you made sure that you get recognized, particularly, I can imagine, in an area where you are blazing the trail as the first woman, get recognized and because of your good work. I think that statement is very accurate and I probably have a hard time making sure that I get recognized. So um, to me, and I think you may have gotten this from the conversation, um, I work as a team mostly, or I try to, because I think that's most effective. And so it's a we more than me. And, um, but but that's how it is for me. You know, I, I enjoy collaborating. I um, enjoy understanding what a group of people um, is bringing to this table because then I can be most effective setting policy with the board. Uh, but it is it is a week. So if I look at um, sort of a homelessness issue in Manchester, for example, because it's it's um, center stage right now, um, I uh, co-chaired a group of people with Patrick Klaus from the United Way. And we got a group of about 40 people together for three different meetings, had four subgroups that worked individually um, in their groups. And we came back to the board with recommendations on things that we need to do. Um, so although you know I helped facilitate that with Patrick, that's a group effort. And, uh, and the group is getting credit for that. It's not just me. Um, and, and there are many projects like that within the city. So as mayor, do you have uh, a a key group of people who you consider your team that you go to regularly, or are you building multiple teams for multiple issues all the time? It seems like there are a core group of people that are involved in the issues in Manchester yes. <laughs> who are available, uh, but certainly we can, you know, cast a wider net when, when uh, we need to. Uh, but, but I think that for years, um, there are certain um, groups that have been involved and so to go back to them to get the history on something and then to think about it new um, is great. We have new leadership um, from the city perspective and many of the departments, so that's a good thing. I have a core team uh, in the mayor's office of three people who work around the clock to make sure uh, that we're serving the community. Um, but we also have new businesses coming in that are asking to participate. And that's, that's honestly one of the things that I'm so grateful for. Um, I, I didn't realize, um, but prior to being mayor, how involved everybody is in Manchester, how, how involved they want to be. Um, so that's been a, a good thing that, you know, businesses want to participate, um, not only in helping to shape who our community is, but in terms of, for example, if our schools need something. Um, they're there to help fund, whether it's technology or books, um, so that, you know, that's been great. Um, so one question that I that I had, which is interesting, you bring up the many people in Manchester. One thing I found is that there are many, I mean, there are so many amazing people in Manchester, many of whom are very passionate about the city and come with history and um, opinions and more history. And so how do you how do you adjudicate the conflict between those people? I mean, often they will have been living here for their whole for generations. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that sometimes they disagree. So how do you how do you work with those persons? It's just you know I have the conversation with them and listen. It's 
so important to listen to some, someone. And sometimes that's all that they need and they haven't been listened to. Um, and then obviously bringing them around to where they need to be. Uh, but it helps also when you can bring someone else in. So it's not just one person, uh, but if they're listening to, they understand the issue and um, possibly a few people can talk to them um, about the issues, how I've had success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> it looks like we have a question from our uh, online audience. What has the latest political process been like for you as we gear up for the NH primary? Yeah, it's been really exciting. Uh, we've had a number of candidates coming into Manchester, and I've had the opportunity to meet with many of them. Um, so, you know, again, we're proud uh, to host Manchester, to have Manchester be a host, and um, and to get another to be able to tell these candidates about the challenges that we're facing in our city and to talk about the opportunities that we have in our city. Uh, when I think back about uh, the last presidential election, although I wasn't here, um, the opioid crisis was, was hitting the extra hard and candidates that were here took that message and then it became a national um, topic. And so, you know, we've been talking about um, you know, the challenges that I've talked about in terms, you know, one for me is funding for public education, um, special education, the opioid crisis continues, and homelessness, but also talking about the opportunities that we've talked about in terms of the growth that we're seeing here in, in Manchester and throughout Manchester. And before we go to any other questions remote, do we have an in-studio audience? Do any of our studio audience have questions? I'm curious about your experience going door to door and doing fundraising as a campaigner. Can you just speak to your experience with that? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so door to door is fun uh, because you get to talk one on one with someone and you're able to listen to what their issues are or what their thoughts are. And again, take that information back and be able to act on it. So that's um, something that to me is critical uh, to running a successful campaign. We did it two years ago and we'll be doing it again. Um, getting out into the neighborhoods, seeing the individuals, seeing the neighborhoods, just need to do it. Um, fundraising is, uh, is fundraising. <laughs> um, one of those necessary evils. And uh, you need to raise the money to run a successful campaign. Um, last campaign, you know, I, I, I had to do TV, I did mail, um, radio, we did all communications, so we had to raise a lot of money. Uh, we're working on that now and having great success, but it's it's awful to be honest with you. It's terrible having to ask someone for money. Um, but it's like it's one of those things that that you have to do, and uh, and, and we're doing it. There's another question online. Um, this person says there is a lack of women in science, technology, engineering, and women and math math industries, especially women leaders. How do you see UNH Manchester fitting into engaging more women in STEM? It's a great question. And I think that we have to start earlier um, than UNH and making sure that, you know, young women in elementary school, middle school, and high school see a path um, to get there. And I think that's where UNH has been successful, UNH Manchester, in making sure that, um, I know we do have summer camps, and uh, making sure that our elementary schools and other schools understand the opportunities for young women that we had both here and in Durham. Uh, my daughter, who's a freshman at Central, um, actually went to the Engineerista camp in Durham a few years ago and um, is doing a program with PAE now. Um, so she's really um, strong in the math and science, first child who is, and I'm not. Um, and so not only educating kids, but educating, educating parents on what those opportunities are so that, again, we can make sure that our young women, young daughters are, um, have the confidence um, to go there because they don't always see the women in leadership roles and we need to make sure we're promoting those and that we as parents can encourage our daughters to do that as well because of the reasons. So a lot of my education went into this like, like that for women. Um, what is happening in Manchester with the um, school systems in terms of um, encouraging women or students in general to be involved in some type of um, career exposure by younger age? 
you don't mind just our speaker here for our online audience is big, big dots. Um, so the question is, uh, um, what is happening as far as STEM education in high schools in Manchester to encourage particularly young women to have career um, opportunities and to be exposed to careers um, at a younger age? So uh, from a high school perspective, uh, they're holding career days. We just had one at West a few weeks ago, and Central's was this past week. So we had individuals coming in from all different industry and talking to kids about the opportunities that are available right in our backyard. Um, one of the things that I did uh, when I became mayor was uh, in visiting businesses. I went over to um, to uh, Velcro, uh, which is headquartered right here in uh, the mill yard. And they were having an issue with workforce. And so uh, we talked about having some space over at West High School and collaborated and came up with a program where they took over one of our classrooms at West High School and it renovated it completely. So it looks like you're walking into Velcro and it's called Velcro University. And so um, they have a 12 week curriculum uh, that students can participate in. And so they're learning soft and hard skills. So soft skills of interviewing for a job and getting your resume together. Once you get a job, here are the typical questions you're gonna get. And then after that, it's learning technology and um, skills where you could walk into a job over at Velcro. And students that are interested can head right into a paid summer internship. And then students could also head into a job. And if they start off in an entry level job there, uh, Velcro pays for college education. And so we're, you know, we're really proud of that program and, uh, and Eversource has actually picked up on that and we're going to be doing it over at Central. And so anything creative like that, that we can do to, again, engage the business community and engage our students, uh, we're, we're trying to really do because we all benefit if our kids have a path to a job and to an education, that's great. And if we're finding kids who can fill the jobs that we desperately need in our community. You know, it's a win-win on both sides. What's interesting that we didn't expect is the feedback back from Velcro and that their employees are doing this program and they've uh, been really positively impacted by that from a professional development perspective. And so it's, it's really been a great program. Uh, looks like there's another question online. Kelly, who is tuning in online, asks, what do you think is the most significant barrier to female leadership? Probably confidence. You know, I, I, I think because it's not necessarily expected, um, and, and that shouldn't be the case, uh, we are all capable of anything we put our minds to, um, and and that is something that we need to change, make sure that everyone understands that, you know, you could do something, I can do something, we can all do whatever we put our mind to, just like anybody else. Um, I think about, for me, you know, when I chose to run for mayor, like I said, it was a very big change for me and having to run citywide. Um, the first time I ran, I lost. I lost by 64 votes or over, and there were over 20,000 votes that were cast. And so it was heartbreaking. Uh, because we we were all in, my family was all in, you know, our volunteers were all in, and we did everything we possibly could, and we lost, ran against it, an incumbent. And, um, but I didn't give up, we didn't give up, and we came back and we worked harder than ever, and we won, you know, and, um, and it's just, you know, we, we need to believe in ourselves, we need to be resilient, resilient, because it may not work out, um, but women can do anything that a man can do and, and we need to believe that and understand that and that's got to be like from the day a little baby girl was born like that's got to be the message any other questions from the audience erica um hi i i share a similar story where i grew up in manchester we left for a while and came back to the family so i'm curious um, we have so many students leaving the state. Um, you have a similar story where you left as well and came back. Why would you encourage a young family to come back to Manchester uh, to stay, live, and raise the kids? From a, I'll just make sure, did, did they hear that online? Yeah, we're good. 
Um, because we have a vibrant community and uh, a community where uh, we all work together and there are tremendous opportunities. Uh, I think from a young family perspective, I talked about, I, I mentioned some of the amenities that we have in our city. Uh, you know, we have the palace, we have the courier, we have the baseball stadium, we have the snow arena, um, we have um, strong schools getting stronger every day. Um, and, and it's a community that cares. And I, I, I don't, I, I feel like for Manchester, it's different than other communities. Um, people do leave, but they come back and, and they come back for a reason because it's different and people care and people understand each other and um, people help each other. And I don't feel that you see that everywhere else. And, um, and so that's what I love about it. And, um, and that's what I would hope keeps people and brings people back. I'd love to know your story. Like what, what brought you back or what do you feel? Um, I, I have to say that I, I live early. I lived in, in a city and I realized after living in both places, Manchester has a little bit of all of that, that you have the urban feel of the city itself and yet you have easy access to mountains and all those things that we, we miss. So, um, it's just the balance of life uh, right here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so you talked a little bit earlier about wanting young people to be more involved in the community. Do you have like steps or suggestions for young people coming out of college, coming out of high school, how they can get more involved in Manchester? There are a number of boards and commissions in the city uh, where young individuals can be involved. Um, there are so many, um, it, it, so I, I meet with a lot of people that say they want to be involved. And my first question is, what are, what, what's your passion? And I think identifying that passion, uh, then I've been able to connect people, whether it's to a nonprofit or to a business uh, where they can help. But I think the first thing is identifying what you're interested in. Um, and then, you know, we serve as a great connector uh, because we're, we're so involved in the community. But in addition to that, there are a number of boards and commissions um, throughout the city uh, that are completely volunteer um, that, that people can participate in. Yeah, I'm going back to education. I know Manchester School District faces many challenges, but in your mind, are the biggest ones? And in addition to the primary and industry, what are some other positive changes you see happening in the district? Can I just repeat that? Um, that what um, Manchester School District faces many challenges. Um, what do you see as the bigger, the biggest challenges for the school district, and what would you really uh, address? So right now, the, there are two key issues that are happening and they're related. Um, the biggest issue that this, in my opinion, that the school district faces is funding, adequate funding. And when you look back at um, the funding of the school district, there's been significant downshifting from the state, which means the local taxpayer has had to pick that up. And in Manchester, we have a tax cap. So we haven't been able to adequately fund the needs of the district for many, many years. And uh, in today's environment, we are, um, our teachers are out of contract. And so it's, um, you know, it's the funding issue and our teachers are, are out of contract, which to me is the biggest issues that we face. Our teachers are amazing. <laughs> they work so hard um, and I'm in the schools a lot. And like I said, my kids went through the public schools and I still have a daughter that at, at one of them. So I know firsthand all that they're dealing with. And uh, we need to do everything we can to sort of make sure that we are funding our schools adequately and the teachers get a fair and sustainable contract. Um, there are a number of bills right now in Concord um, that are being proposed that would get uh, additional funds to Manchester. I have been in Concord supporting those and writing letters in support of those to ensure again uh, that, that we are, are funding our schools. Um, that's, that's the biggest issue that we're facing. Question for the audience? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, the second part of that was what do you see some positive changes happening? Positive changes. Yeah, um, again, not in terms of changes, but the teachers and the administrators in the school district, are, they're working so hard to ensure that our kids are receiving the education that they need. 
Uh, we're actually right now going through a redistricting process uh, because some of our class sizes are high um, or, or at, uh, are larger than they should be. So we're readjusting that so that our class sizes are, are decreasing. Um, on the west side of uh, the city, we have a leader in need program um, that is currently in some of our schools right now, a handful of schools. But they're going to—it's going to be in every school on the west side, which is amazing. It's this program where kids are learning um, to set goals, to reach their goals, to communicate, to work together. At the the age of five, it starts, and when you go into um, Gospel Park, where it is right now, you can visibly see the difference between these kids that are going through the leader, leader in need program versus kids at a different school that are not. So that we will have that program that follows kids from elementary school to middle school to high school is fantastic. And I'm really excited about the impact that that will have on our school district. Um, the supports that we have from the community, from the colleges and universities is tremendous. Um, and you know, we are, are working every day to make sure we have a better understanding of what we can do, what we should do, and again, to set our kids up for success going forward. Um, I feel, and I have to say this, that we have our challenges in the Manchester Public Schools, but we are providing good education and great opportunities to kids. I know that you're, you're a proud graduate, I'm a proud graduate, my kids are, and so you know we need to we need to promote the good. And I'm grateful for the question that you asked um, because we do have strength there. Um, but but they do have to balance with our challenges, and we can't take our eye off the challenges. So another question, um, I recently saw a study that talked about how one of the reasons that women step back in their careers as opposed to stepping forward and perhaps taking on a leadership responsibility is <clears throat> the lack of flexible workplace policies. And I know in Manchester, we have a lot of businesses that have been around for a long time doing this in the same way. Have you, uh, do you have ideas or have you had conversations with, with businesses in Manchester about creating policies that would be more family friendly. Personally, I haven't, but I know at the state level they're having those conversations and I'm continuing to support, you know, we need to make sure that we are flexible. I think that, you know, the city has uh, been flexible in terms of work environment, um, but, you know, that really hasn't come up as a topic from a local level. Um, I do think back about my career, and um, one, of the, one of the significant changes that Came for me was uh, when I was working. I was living and working in Boston. Then I moved back and I was commuting on the bus uh, going to Boston uh, three days a week. And yeah, um, which is why I'm a huge woman for commuter rail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, at, at that time, and I had two young, I mean, probably you know, five-month-old and two-year-old at home. Um, you know, it was. I was asked to, to stay. I needed to be in Boston five days a week. It came with a promotion. It would be a great career move. Um, we want you to do this. But I didn't, I, it just wasn't where I wanted to be, you know? And so I'm very grateful I didn't do that. Uh, I wanted to spend more time with my family and um, continue in the workforce. And because I did that is where I am today. Uh, so it's, it is very interesting, um, but the work balance is critical to ensure that you know women do have the opportunity um, to take those roles. And, and sometimes I think the roles that you take, um, you're not even realizing where it's going to go. So when I became involved in my kids' elementary school PTO, there was no way I, you know I didn't visualize that as bringing me to, to a place where I would run the school board. Uh, but it opened up my eyes in terms of what the issues were. And then, um, what is the best advice that you've ever received? For, and then also, what would parting advice be for those of us in the room who want to advance um, their career and make a difference in the world? I think to believe in yourself. You know, you need to believe in yourself and be strong and be confident. Because when you set your mind to something, you can get it done. And, um, Leverage, you know, the people around you, partner with the people around you. We're all stronger as a team. 
And um, but but it's just believing in yourself and that you can do something. Are there any uh, other questions in the audience or looks like there might be one online? Okay. Kathleen asks, what is Manchester business leaders in the state of New Hampshire doing to increase younger generations to come to work, live, and play here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, we have a number of jobs in the city and more jobs coming. So we have to, we have to make sure that individuals understand what those jobs are and make sure that there's a track and a path for young individuals to get there. Um, affordable housing is important. So ensuring that uh, young folks have an opportunity to live here and can afford to live here and be able to live here and enjoy the amenities that I've talked about. Uh, but those are three things that I think are really important. We need to have, uh, you know, I think it's great that we have so many colleges and universities in our city. We need to make sure that, that the graduates understand the jobs that are here and then have the housing opportunities and then they can enjoy the city that we have. How do you plan on leveraging our um, Manchester's national prominence over the next few months to promote these ideas of we have jobs and this is a great place to live? So it's having access to these presidential candidates. They're coming in weekly. Um, and so I've had the opportunity and continue to have the opportunity to sit down with these individuals one on one and talk to them about it. So we are known from a national perspective, New Hampshire as being sort of the place where the opioid crisis hit the hardest. And those are the questions that I'll get initially. And then, but I can change that and have changed that to talk about the positives that we have going on here. You know, that, that we have Oracle and Dyne and uh, Texas Instruments and Amazon and, you know, the Army and the colleges and universities that we have in our city, the great things that we have here. Um, and that the residents of Manchester and South Hampshire have a wealth of information um, and want to participate in this process. Um, so, so those are the things that I've been talking to candidates about one on one. Another question? Uh, someone asks, do you have any professional golden rules? Uh, I, I, respect is important to me. Um, encouraging others to participate is important to me. Um, being open and honest and listening. Uh, so if there are, are there any other questions maybe from the online audience? Someone asks, as the first woman to be elected to Manchester's highest office, what advice do you have for women who are about to graduate from UNH next month and who want to break barriers? So depending on what the barrier is, make connections with uh, that industry or that line of work. Um, and I think UNH is a great uh, has a great alumni network, and it's really amazing if you're in New Hampshire, the connections that you make um, and can make, not just when you're in college, but after college. So, you know, I mentioned um, Maureen Borgard, that that's just one of the individuals I didn't know at UNH, but I'm working with almost on a daily basis, and there are so many other people, uh, but to capitalize on those relationships, and uh, because that'll help you in terms of getting a start and getting your Getting a better understanding of, um, of what you need to learn in order to be able to get there. Do you have other questions? Yeah, so, do you have daughters have any interest in doing politics? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sarah, Sarah's a sophomore at UNH, English and International Affairs. And um, she was a representative in the last, um, was, but uh, she, she's been involved in some political things. I don't know that she sees herself running uh, for anything, but I didn't either um, when I was at UNH, and my youngest daughter has no desire. Although, 
they're very active in the campaign and knock doors and make phone calls and do whatever they need to do. So I'm grateful for their participation there. And you never know. So I guess one final question is about when things go wrong. So um, I recently had an experience where I was at an event and I was talking about some something or some some issue, and I realized that the person behind me, if they heard what I was saying, might not have been good. How when you uh, not that you put your foot in your mouth ever, but if that happens, <laughs> um, how do you? What advice do you give other women on how to fix a situation that they've gone wrong? I mean, I think calling it right we just have to be honest because nobody's perfect and to me it's better to to just call it right there and to apologize if you need to apologize um because you know i, I mean if that were to happen to me with you i would get it because i've been there and so i, I just think that honesty and being open and just thank you well thank you so much and thank you everyone who came and joined us in this Warm room today. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your. I know 